like watching these numbers go up, you're just watching them as they people enter. You're just like, ooh. All right, so I'll just go ahead and start off with an introduction real quick before, as we let everyone kind of join in. Um, so my name's Andrew. I'm with the Cohen Military Family Clinic at Endeavors. Um, joining me here today is our outreach director, Chris. Um, and then we also have Andrea and Leslie with the Rosalind Carter Institute, and they will be the ones doing the presentation. Uh, so I'd just like to kind of go over a couple quick ground rules before um, we get the presentation started. Um, we will have two surveys that we will send to you or that we will provide at the end of the training um, and it will also be emailed to you. So if y'all can do that survey, we would really appreciate it. Um, it's just to help get better feedback on these trainings and how we can make them and improve them for, for our clients and the community. Um, next, we just have any questions that are directed. We are going to be the ones presenting all of the um, PowerPoints and having our beautiful faces on camera. Um, so we do just ask that everyone kind of keeps their video off and um, directs their questions to the Q&A box or the comment uh, box, or the chat box uh, below. Um, this is just so we can kind of get through the PowerPoint, uh, through the presentation and answer any questions as we go. Um, we are going to go straight through the training um, with no breaks. We just want to leave a little bit of time at the end to answer any, anyone's questions if y'all do have them at the end. Um, so before I go ahead and get uh, let Andrea and Leslie start on this beautiful presentation, I'll go ahead and do a real quick briefing on my end. So, all right, so again, my name is Andrew Santos. I'm a psych tech with the Cone Military Family Clinic at Endeavors. Uh, we all able to see my screen, okay? Okay, perfect. Um, so we'll just go ahead and do a real quick briefing on the services we offer if anyone is interested. I will also put my information in the chat box for y'all to have. Um, so feel free to email me. Okay, there we go. All right, so at our clinic, we um, do counseling services for post-911 veterans and their families, regardless of their ability to pay, discharge status, or who the veteran determines as a family member. So one of the beauties of our clinic is we don't just work with the veteran only, um, we can work with their family members as well, and the family member actually determines the, who their family is. So even if they're not blood related, we can still see them, uh, the veteran determines that family member. Um, this includes National Guard and Reserves, and then of course, active duty family members as well. We're not just a uh, clinic that provides counseling services. We're an integrated clinic, so we can also provide case management and med management as well. Um, so usually anyone coming in for therapy never has one issue, right? Um, if they do have anything else that they're needing in the community that they need to get addressed, um, they'll get a referral to our case manager, and um, our case manager can assist them with getting anything, any other needs met, maybe financial needs, um, legal needs, anything like that um, in the community. Uh, also, if you need any kind of medication, um, you will also get a referral to our uh, psychiatrist who can also prescribe meds as well. Um, the biggest thing that I like to let people know is we are a short to medium term clinic model. Um, so on average, it's about eight to 15 sessions. We just don't have the capabilities of doing longer term care at our clinic. Um, so anyone that really has um, illnesses like uh, PTSD, depression, anxiety, are definitely uh, kind of the, the perfect clientele for us as far as who we can work with. Um, the issues that we tend to refer out just because we don't have those needs that we can provide at our clinic, our uh, un unmedicated bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, those kind of things. Those are longer term issues that we just can't seem to, uh, that we can't work with at our clinic. Um, we do also have life skill groups or classes and support groups. Um, this, this caregiver training is an example of that. Um, we do do different events um, throughout the year with different community partners. So um, just be on the lookout for that and we'll definitely um, love to have you all attend more groups. Um, at our clinic, we also eliminate all barriers to care. We provide childcare at our clinic free of charge for anyone that does uh, is needing services. Of course, this is when we are um, doing face-to-face -face therapy currently because we're not um, doing face-to-face -face because of COVID. Um, then obviously this doesn't count, but when we do um, open face-to-face, -face, this will still be uh, active and uh, available. Um, we do also provide transportation within 20 miles. To anyone that does need the transportation, we partner with Uber, they'll go pick you up and drop you off. Um, and then last, we do telehealth anywhere to any clients in the state of Texas as needed. Um, it is about a 15 to 20 minute screening process that we do have to go through for everyone that would be interested in services. Um, but once we get everyone screened, we'll, we'll definitely get y'all scheduled within a week to two. So it's a pretty quick turnaround. Um, hours of operation, just like to put this up here. We are open um, extended hours Tuesday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And they're also open on Saturdays till 1 p.m. as well, um, just to kind of meet the needs of the community in the eight to five uh, people that have the eight to five jobs. Okay, and then last I'll just put this leave this up here real quick just for y'all This is my um, contact information and then if you do have any questions just general questions for our clinic There's our uh, clinic information as well. And then that's going to be our intake number if anyone is interested um, That's our intake number. Just um, 
If we don't answer, leave a voicemail, we will get back to you within one business day. So and that's all I have for y'all on my end. So I appreciate, um, again, y'all taking the time to, to join us in this caregiver training. I will go ahead and um, hand it over to Andrea and Leslie and let them go ahead and do uh, their wonderful training that they're providing to us. I guess that means I'm up, guys. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And just say hello and welcome. If you're here, then you're here for the We Are Caregivers webinar. If you somehow found yourself in this room by accident, stick around. If you're unsure if caregiver is a term that reflects or relates to you, stick around. We're going to be discussing caregivers and caregiving and how to make that journey the best it can be without neglecting our own needs. And if you're still thinking, I'm still not sure about this crazy girl in this box talking to me about caregivers and caregiving, give me just a few more minutes and let me echo the words of our founder, former First Lady Rosalind Carter, and that there are only four types of people in this world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need a caregiver. So maybe this isn't you today, but maybe one day it will be. Or maybe through going through this webinar, you'll understand that you know somebody that is doing this work. So let's go and learn together on how to go through this journey without being neglectful of our vital needs so we can all be healthy and well. So I'm gonna give everybody a few minutes, a few seconds. I don't want you to change your mind. We're all still here. Like uh, my good friend Andrew said, he laid out some ground rules, but I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how we're going to present this webinar. First off, of course, you are all muted. We want to hear and make you feel empowered to voice your opinion and participate with us, but we don't want you to feel like you have to yell to be heard. So my good colleague, Andre <coughs> is here with me. If you see her, she's waving in the box. She's amazing. She's gonna be helping me today along with Andrew. We're gonna be sharing some sharing questions with you guys. So that means there's gonna be some quick poll questions, quick yes or no's. And then we're gonna throw up some sharing questions in the chat to give you a little bit more time to type out as we're talking and working through this webinar together. Also through this webinar, we're gonna be having five pro tips. Pro tips, you ask, where did they come from? They come from caregivers like you and me. These are tips that we found through the data, through all of our program, through our caregiving stories that have come to us through our completed program caregivers and what they say is the most vital thing that's helped them. With these pro tips, I cannot let you go into your week without issuing you some challenges. So along with the pro tips, I'm also going to be giving you some challenges to implement these tips throughout your life in the best way possible. So with that being said, if you guys are ready and AC is ready, Andrea, I'm ready, then we can get started. So we're going to get started today and I am going to talk a little bit about me and who I am. I can't expect for you to participate without telling you a little bit about myself and what I do. My name is Leslie Poole. I have an educational background in mental health. I've also worked on the front line as a psychiatric rehabilitation practitioner, say that five times fast. And I work at the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving as a training and implementation specialist, which basically means I have the best job in the entire world. It means I get to work with several programs to help caregivers throughout their caregiving journey through training our caregiving coaches, through developing content and through research. I love my work and the job that I do, particularly because I have been weaved throughout caregiving and caregiving journeys throughout my entire life. So on your screen to the far left, if I'm sharing the right screen, am I sharing the right screen, guys? <laughs> yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Andrea, for keeping me on track. <laughs> To the far left, you're going to see a picture of me and one of my good friends, Corey. I met Corey in seventh grade, and when you're from a small town like I am, knowing your best friend since seventh grade is bragging rights, because that means you're not just friends at that point, you're family. 
After we graduated high school, Corey went into the Navy and when he returned after four years away, it was really hard to adjust and really hard coming home. And it was really hard for us being really young and understanding what caregiving means. We fought really hard to get Corey the best of the best that we could in our small little community. We fought really hard to be the best caregivers we could be and it was a hard journey. Unfortunately, Corey died by suicide on September the 16th of 2011, but his death was a promise that I made to work with and for others in the caregiving space to help you understand that the journey is hard, but it doesn't have to be full of doom and gloom. There are specks of hope and triumph sprinkled throughout, and I wanted to help others recognize that. Also throughout this presentation, you're gonna be hearing real examples from other caregiving experiences I've had. If you look to the far right of your screen, you're gonna see two beautiful women. Those are my aunts. My aunt Cheryl to the far right of your screen is severely developmentally disabled. I've had the pleasure of providing her care since I can remember. And to the right of, to the left of her, excuse me, is my aunt Cheryl. Together we form a care team to help for my aunt Debbie and making sure her needs are met. But I also had the great privilege of being a caregiver to my aunt Cheryl and helping ensure that she is well taken care of in this journey we're going on. You'll also hear examples in the middle of your screen. You'll see a beautiful older woman surrounded by all of her grandchildren. And that is my grandmother. And yes, those are all of her grandkids. There's a lot of us. The best one is the oldest one, which is me, in case you didn't know that. She worked with my grandfather and helped provide care for him as he battled Alzheimer's. Uh, and we were privileged to be part of her care team during that journey and watching her provide care. So I hope you'll see that at RCI, we don't just say we're caregivers, we really are caregivers. We're very honest about the experiences that we have and really work towards helping others in this space. So now that we've gotten to know each other, I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna start today by posing a question. I'm gonna have my good friend, my good new friend, Andrew, pop up a poll for me. And we're gonna start off by asking a question, caregiver. Is that a term that resonates with you? Do you identify with it? Or is it when somebody says, are you your loved one's caregiver? You're a little unsure. You kind of, uh, I mean, I'm their son. I'm their daughter. I mean, am I really a caregiver? Caregiving is hard. It's a hard thing to self-identify it with. That's what we found in our programs. It's the first step that we need to take in our journey. So as the poll pops up, please answer the question. Let's see what we got. Some of you may say, of course I'm a caregiver. Some of you may say, oh, I'm not really so sure. Some of you may say, no, not really something I identify with, but I'm gonna tell you a story about the importance of self-identification. It's my first caregiver story of the day, so get ready. We're gonna talk about my Aunt Debbie. So there was a time recently, we we're living in a COVID-19 world where my Aunt Debbie had to be taken to the hospital. Her medications were off, it meant she was falling a lot. And for somebody with a developmental disability, communication skills are often very hard to develop and adapt. My Aunt Debbie functions on probably about, uh, I would say around about a five-year-old. So think about that in the body of a six-year-old woman, it gets kind of complicated understanding what pain means, what hunger means, what thirsty means, what you're just unhappy means. So my Aunt Debbie was having a hard time, had to be taken to the emergency room. Being one of her caregivers, I happened to be in the same town that she was being taken to, so I met them at the hospital. And when I get there, these doctors are all crowding over her, nurses are asking all these questions, trying to get her to communicate. She's getting nervous and scared. She doesn't know what's happening. I'm sitting in the corner going, oh man, this is a lot. What are we doing? And the whole time the doctors and the nurses are continually asking, who's our caregiver? Where's our caregiver? Are you her caregiver? And I sat there and I'm watching this happening. I'm nervous, my Aunt Debbie's nervous. I'm trying to call my Aunt Cheryl. It's just an overwhelming experience. And I realized that they weren't asking caregiver as a term of, oh, why are you bringing this person here? 
they're asking who the caregiver is because that's the expert in the room. And I realized going through that emergency room visit that caregiver is a term that can be overwhelming. It's a scary term for some of us that's you're, you're literally accepting responsibility of care for another person and the stakes are really high, sometimes literally life or death. But when we accept and identify as a caregiver, we are stating our foot on the ground and saying that we are the experts in the room and there's nobody better to understand the care that is needed to be given to this individual better than me. Like I said, I've been with Aunt Debbie since day one. Nobody in that room except for my Aunt Cheryl knows what it's like to take care of her and her needs. So as we go forward with this presentation, remember caregiver means that you are an expert and the care that you provide your loved one. All right, so I just wanna let you know, Leslie, before you continue, we did get the results back. We have 36 okay. that do identify as a caregiver, uh, six that don't, and then four that are undecided, that are do not, uh, so that's great numbers. Yeah, how exciting, how exciting. So some of you may not identify as caregivers. Some of you are unsure. Some of you are like, heck yeah, this is me. I am raising my hand, set my foot on the ground. I'm the expert. But let's look at what does it mean to be a caregiver? Sometimes we get that definition a little bit mixed up because we think caregiving is a sum of the tasks that we do. So I want you to think a few minutes, a few minutes, a few seconds. They only give me 60 minutes. So you only get a few seconds. Think about the ways in which you provide care for your loved one. And my good friend Andrea is going to pop up a chat question and ask you a sharing question, if you will. What ways do you provide care for your loved one? And that's if you want to share, you can post some of the ways you provide care. I see some buttons clicking right now. That's exciting. And we want to look at what tasks do you do? Do you do it from a sum of the tasks you complete per day? With over 5,000 caregivers that have completed our program, what we found is that there's really not a set definition of what a caregiver is and what a caregiver does. Now that could mean that you as a caregiver might be spending your time bathing, dressing, helping your loved one eat, those kinds of tactical things. But we've also found out that caregiving can also mean that it's just you providing that emotional support to somebody. So in that way, we are spending in our military caregiver program, those caregivers, ah, look, I found somebody's clicking on, let's see, uh, managing triggers and trying to get him treatment for PTSD. Yeah, that's a really good one that, at, that shows that it's not just those tactical things like bathing, eating, dressing, those things that it takes a person to kind of get ready for their day but it's also about really supporting them, providing that emotional support they may need. Yeah, med management, changing, cleaning, feeding. See, you guys are doing a lot every day. Look at that, yeah. So that emotional support that you also provide, I will tell you that in my time with Corey, what we did is, we weren't so much helping him eat or dress or bathe, but we were <coughs> providing that emotional support to him. We were making sure that, if he had a trigger, that he had somebody he trusted there to calm him down. And while some of us spend a little bit of time doing that, some of us might spend hours doing that. So in our military program, we found that those military caregivers are spending on average around about five to nine hours a day providing some type of care. So that's a lot, look at this, helping him remember to take his medications. Yeah, so important. All of these things that you're doing make up caregiving tasks that signal that you're the expert in care and that your self-identification is a caregiver. You are giving an expert level of care that nobody else in the room can provide. Yeah, I see one, I'm a holistic nurse and a caregiver to home, students, family, and the military community. Look at you. All around, you're providing those care tasks and being a caregiver to everybody around you. So we're going to look at some different ways how we can do that. I'm excited. I'm excited to help you guys with these five pro tips because I, I think they're going to make a real big difference. So when we look at our care tasks, we also have to take into account that our new normal has changed. 
you know, we had to adjust to being a caregiver, right? And now we're having to adjust to COVID-19 life. And me and Andrew were just talking about before we joined on that, man, 2020, COVID-19. I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm just looking to make some friends and make the best of our situation. It's crazy. So now that we're in this new normal, let's think about trying to care for your ourselves and our loved ones. You know, that's easier said than done, right? Like, oh, you know, we should be in a world where everything's automated now. It's a pandemic. But remember, in our military caregiving program, we found that our military caregivers are spending around about five to nine hours of care a day. And for some of you, that could be way, way more. And let's look at what things have become easier or harder since COVID-19. So my good friend, Andrea, again, is gonna throw up a sharing question. What areas or tasks have become easier or harder since uh, COVID-19? I will tell you that being in a rural area, COVID-19, has made delivery possible and it has changed my life. <laughs> I've never had to set foot in a grocery store again. It makes me so excited. But it's also, uh, yeah, doing shopping for him. Yeah, it, it, it's hard. Sometimes it's harder because those quick items that we need to go out and get, that's a process now. And having somebody come into home to try to provide care that our loved ones might need might also be really hard because, you know, the pandemic we're trying to keep everybody safe at one time so let's look at what identifying the term of caregiver means in a COVID-19 world look going to all doctor's appointments are harder but virtual appointments are good I know we're living in a virtual world it's hard it's hard to kind of switch back and forth and making sure that we're getting our loved ones needs met and our needs met I'm glad you pointed it out we're going to be talking about that in one of our pro tips later but identifying as a caregiver, understanding that your care, the tasks that you're doing are caregiving tasks and caregiver is an expert designation means that you're allowing others to understand the journey you are going on. So when we step up and we step into this role, yeah, finding entertainment outside the home. Oh, I hear you. I'm a caregiver. I got two wild children at home. Entertainment, man. Oh, we're at the movies when you need them. But when we step up and we step into the role as a caregiver, we allow others to see, I am the expert. I am the one that handles these tasks that make sure they are accomplished because it's important to continue to do that, to provide the level of care that my loved one needs, but also be able to understand what I need as a caregiver. So in our military program, our military caregivers have listed their health as good. But remember, this was all pre-COVID-19 numbers. And if we've seen anything from COVID-19 is that health can quickly turn from good to bad if we're not taking care of ourselves. So in order to be effective caregivers, we have to first learn how to take care of ourselves. And prioritizing self-care is in the best interest of you and your loved one. We always say at RCI, you cannot pour from an empty cup. If you're a caregiver and you keep pouring for an empty cup, there's none left for you. So when we're looking at our, our tasks that we're doing and what self-care means, let's look at what does it mean to take care of yourself and before we get into our pro tips i'm going to give you a few seconds as we transition slides yeah limited care limiting care you know what does it mean to be self-care that you are in a place of self-care for me i will tell you that it means my whole self is taken care of that I have all those things in play to understand what I need to do in order to stay healthy through exercise, eating, doing those hobbies that I enjoy. I also understand what it means to take care of those that I care give for. And the way that I do that, look at that. Yeah, all of you, man, you're, what does it mean to be and be in this place of self-care to care for yourself? You guys are great and great at answering all these questions. Taking time to go to the doctor. Yeah, that's one of those. That's one of those that's really hard. 
you know, we, we, we assume that our care recipient, that loved one needs all these doctor's appointments and we're so willing to put them off ourselves. We neglect the care that we need. So we're going to move on. I'm really excited you guys are paying attention to the chat, filling it in with me. It's fun. Mindfulness. Yeah. Mindfulness is another really good self-care technique. We're going to start today by talking about our five pro tips. How do we prioritize self-care to make sure we are taking care of ourselves in the best way possible? And the first pro tip we're gonna look at today, healthy boundaries. Taking care of yourself means that you first have boundaries. You have to have boundaries. In our OFC program, Operation Family Caregiver, We've seen that about 81% of caregivers are caring for someone with PTSD, 64% are caring for someone with pain, 53% are caring for someone with a mental health challenge, just like depression. It's really hard. You're doing a lot, you're having a lot come into you. So we have to have healthy boundaries. And how do we set those healthy boundaries? First, we know them and name them. And we know them and name them because number two, we understand that having healthy boundaries means you understand what it takes for you to be the best caregiver possible. I know somebody just put it in the chat, very hard. Healthy boundaries are very hard, yes, but they are much needed. And I'm hoping I can give you some simple examples while we do this. So boundaries, when we talk about healthy boundaries, we know them and name them. We understand they allow us to be the best caregiver we can be for ourselves and for the others we care for. But we also know that boundaries can be as simple or as complex as we need them to be. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a grandma story. All right. My grandmother's name is Grandma Carol. So I'm, we're all going to get used to them. If you ever see them in public, please call them Grandma and Aunt Cheryl. They would love it. So when we were taking care of my grandfather, when he was transitioning into the moderate to late stages of Alzheimer's, which if you've ever been through that, that's a very hard transition to go through that kind of signals the end is right around the corner. We're getting into a spot where we're going to have to call in more help and our level of care is going to be a little bit more complex and different. So you saw in the picture, my grandma has a lot of grandchildren and we all love coming and visiting my grandmother and my grandfather. They are a very integral part in us growing up and still are. So when we wanted to come see my grandmother, because that's grandma's house, ain't nobody's house better than grandma's house, guys. She makes sure you're all taken care of and you have food, drinks, whatever you want. She takes care of you. But what we realized in that she was providing care to my grandfather to a point where she was, she did not have any care for herself at the end of the day. So we had to look at what are simple things to help grandma in this journey. One of the things we looked at is visiting at times. What are those really, really good times during the day that really make this the best possible time? Times where he's maybe a little bit more lucid or he's not as agitated. Maybe it's right after he had some of his medication. So he's a little bit more with it than he was when than he is probably earlier or later than the day. And then we also kind of had to do like a what to expect when visiting protocol. So with dementia also comes, I like to call it, you lose some of your filters and grandpa lost some of his filters. So we all had to if the younger grandchildren are coming over, grandpa lost some of his filters. So we don't know, you know, be forewarned. We don't know what's going to happen. But having that and establishing that my grandmother during those times that you're visiting is simply there to be a caregiver allowed her to enjoy the moment. She didn't feel the pressure of having to take care of all of us, having to make sure that all of her grandchildren were fed, well read, had everything they needed. She was allowed to sit there. She was allowed to be a caregiver and have that time and also save some of her energy so she could be herself and take care of herself at the end of the day. So remember, healthy boundaries, know them, name them. What are things that just make your day easier or hard? What are those lines in the sand that you want to draw? Also, you know that being having healthy boundaries means you're being the best caregiver you can be and that they can be as simple or as complex as they need to be. So with our first pro tip, 
comes our first challenge. So take a few seconds and I want you to think about a healthy boundary you want to establish this week. And if you want to share, you can pop it up in the chat and share with us. I'm going to share my challenge for the week. Virtual learning, guys, it has been just a beast. And we have gotten off our schedule at my house, which has made the day so much harder. So my challenge for the week, my healthy boundary, is that we are going to make sure that everybody, everything, we are shutting down for the night between 8 and 8.30 p.m. We are going to have some quiet time so everybody can get a good rest at night and we can wake up early and wake up refreshed and ready to go. Ah, like art, a walk in nature, take some time. See, yeah, we're getting it guys. But let's talk about healthy boundaries. We said it was hard, right? Somebody mentioned in the chat, it's a healthy, setting healthy boundaries is hard. But we're gonna move on to pro tip number two. You, how you set healthy boundaries is because you use that in a combination with assertive communication. Ah, yeah. So. We're going to throw up, I'm in grad school. <laughs> you will. What are things that you enjoy, Ronald? You can find this, I'm sure. Your healthy boundary. Maybe it's going to bed a little bit earlier. Um, so we're going to throw up another sharing question, and I'm going to ask you, what do you think the most important word for you as a caregiver is to know? What's the most important word for you as a caregiver? And it's going to go back that healthy boundaries is hard sometimes. We got to know them and name them. Ah, yeah, no. First one off the bat, you're right. The most important word for you to know in establishing healthy boundaries as a caregiver in assertive communication is just the word no. And no, 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 thank you. Saying the word no allows you to reaffirm that healthy boundary, but also use really good assertive communication skills. Remember, as a caregiver, you're getting a lot of hours of care a day. Your plate is full. No is a really important and simple assertive communication word that allows us to express those healthy boundaries and to protect ourselves our, as a caregiver and those that we love that we're getting care for. No is a word that allows us to advocate in appointments. It allows us to get the best care that we need. No means that you are also using self-care with your healthy boundaries because you're using assertive communication. So when we look at the word no and we're using it in a sentence, some really quick examples that we've been able to decipher that have worked really well, no, this isn't, this isn't working for us. Or no, we really wanted to try to have an early night. No, this, we haven't tried that before, but we'd really like to. Or no, we've heard this, but we really want to know what is the best course of action. No can't be a complete sentence. No can be as assertive as you need it to be. It can be gentle too. So when we look for assertive communication, we're remembering that when we use it and when we say our word no, that is asking for what we want. No, I can't do that because I want more time for myself. I need some more self-care. I need some more space where I can just be. No is socially appropriate. Sometimes, I know, I live in the South and yes is a word that my grandmother loves to say. Yes, 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 yes. We'll do all the things. But really helping her understand that no is an important word and she can say, no, I can't go do that. Grandpa's having a bad day. Or for Corey, we used to say, oh, we'd really like to come and eat dinner, but it's a really crowded restaurant and that's just not going to work for us. But you can always come over here and eat with us. No is a way that allows us to identify those boundaries, say what we want them to say, and also use it in a way where it's not passive aggressive or hostile. And it's really considering our needs and the needs and feelings and welfare of others. But when we have assertive communication, we also have to remember the nonverbal cues with assertive communication. So I'm going to try to tell you a story so you can focus on me and we're going to have some one on one time. So I'm going to give you an example of 
nonverbal assertive communication. So non-assertive verbal communication features several things. One, eye contact. So when I use eye contact, I'm using direct eye contact. I'm not staring and I'm not glaring at you. I'm simply giving you my attention. Posture, I'm not slouching, I'm not rigid or tense, I'm open and I'm confident. I'm telling you no because it's in the best interest of myself and my loved one. I also have my facial expressions. They match what I'm trying to say. Even though no can be a harsh word, it can be said in a loving tone. No, I really want to go to bed early tonight. So my dear lovely children, no more rounds of Fortnite. We're gonna get to bed early and we're gonna have a really good night so our day is really awesome tomorrow, see? Instead of saying, no, you cannot play the Fortnite, not anymore. You notice the difference? Which one do you think is going to get what we need as caregivers? When we use our tone, our verbal expressions with our nonverbal expressions, it allows us to open up to a world of possibilities so we can get what we need done, done. So I'm going to share my screen so we can move on. Oh, yep, and I have to issue a challenge. I issued a pro tip. So my challenge to you guys, I want you to write down or think through one thing you'd like to assertively communicate to somebody. That can be a doctor, a care team member, anybody you want to establish a healthy boundary with. You can share it with us in the chat. Like I said in my example, I'm going to say no to the extra round of Fortnite tonight. And all of my children, I can tell you, are looking at me with wide eyes, very scared that they're going to bed early tonight. But no, no fortnight. We're going to have a nice, quiet night so we can get well rested. So as you answer that question, I'm going to move into our third pro tip. We're knocking them down, guys. And our third pro tip of the day is going to be to create a care profile. You should have a care profile as a living document. You can create one of your own in any way format that works best for you. I will tell you, I've seen them done through Excel spreadsheets. I've seen them done through PowerPoints. I've seen them done through Microsoft Word. Whatever the format works best for you, use that format. But a care profile is a customized summary of caregiving needs. It's meant to be like a very quick reference to really gain some insights and understandings. So it's really important that we have one as caregivers because it helps us to really begin to understand what you and your loved one need and what the team needs to do to support you in the best way possible. Having a care profile, I can tell you from my point, from my experiences, really decreases the stress and gives me peace of mind. I know I have a reference. I know if I have to go somewhere, I have this document to help those that I provide care for. And developing a care profile, there are really some basics that you need to know. We've highlighted six basics to help you get started in your care profile. So in one of those, you're gonna be, need to be aware of your needs. Being aware of your needs and making the right choices to make sure your needs are met will make your caregiving journey and your self-care journey better. What are those things that you need to do every day to make sure you're being the best that you can be? The second thing is the needs of your loved one. Being aware of their conditions, knowing how to take care of your loved one with confidence, what are some symptoms, some things that need to be made aware of because of what their conditions are, or their challenges are. Even the smallest need or challenge needs to be given as much seriousness as the big ones, you know. We have to take it all into account. The whole picture makes the decisions. So with that, we also want you to be aware of your goals. Yes, your goals as a caregiver. We all need goals to strive to, to achieve. Goals as both a caregiver and an individual empower you. They help you to make decisions that you are comfortable with. And with achieving those goals, it gives you a sense of accomplishment. It lets you learn and grow each step of the way. I always say we never have failures, we only have growth. 
there is no perfect caregivers in this world. And I will tell you from our experiences, from the data that we have, from the stories that we've heard, from our own internal experiences as caregivers, none of us are perfect. And we always feel like we mess up. But if we have goals to strive to, they let us know where we're growing and learning and how the journey can be better. So set realistic goals. I'll tell you when we started this and I set healthy boundaries, what are one of the things I said? I said, I wanted to try to establish a nightly routine between the app between eight and 830. I left flexibility in there and I left flexibility because none of us are perfect and I don't know what the day is going to hold. So having that time makes it a really realistic way for me to reach my goal at the end of the week and help me really strive to our long term goal, which is really having a really great day where we're all on track where I don't we don't have to worry about what school projects we missed or if Aunt Cheryl has her medicine or if Aunt Debbie needs something special from the store we've a accounted for that in our goals and know how to get those things done. The next thing we, we highlight in our care profile is your care team. Think about when you needed something or something was wrong. Who is the first person that you called? Who is that person that came to help you? Those are individuals that are on your care team. It's important that you have support and realize that you have support all around you. And those individuals are part of a bigger team, a bigger network there to empower and help you through your journey. So when we look at a care team, it's important that you have kind of three key things in your care team. One, you know who's on your care team. Two, you know what they do. And three, and probably the most important thing, they know who they are and they know what they do on your care team. It's all about understanding that this is supposed to be a living document that those who need access to it know where to find it and know how it can help them in supporting you in this work, in this journey that you're doing. Another one that we, oh, oh I moved too fast, I moved too fast. All right, another one that we find in our journey that's really important is conditions that are currently challenging your loved one. When you look at conditions, we understand that your loved one might be suffering from more than one. For me and Corey, he had PTSD and he had severe depression. For my grandfather, he had Alzheimer's, but he also has some chronic medical conditions too. For my Aunt Debbie, she has severe, she's severely developmentally disabled, which brings on a whole host of things of how she matures, how her brain functions, and how her body ages. And my Aunt Cheryl provides so much care, I have to make sure she's taking care of herself. So understanding those conditions allows us to understand how to provide that support and those conditions care team members, how they support your loved one the best way they can. So it allows us to see that there's more than one thing at play. It's not just simply a TBI. It's not just simply PTSD. It's not just simply depression. There's a whole range of things that play into your loved one and how to take care of them. Another aspect of your care team you need to have is medications. Knowing how to effectively administer a medication is crucial, ensuring overall health, as wrong dosages could be potentially deadly. So when, in your, when you're doing your care profile, make sure you list your medications, the dosages, maybe what they're for and what challenge they're trying to help uh, alleviate or make a little bit better. Because this can also be really useful in advocating in your doctor's appointments and really saying like, hey, this is what this was supposed to do. This is not working. It also helps in pharmacy visits. If you have questions, you have this profile created, you and your, your uh, medical professional can get the best care and get those answers that you need. So now we've done pro tip number three, which means you get your third challenge. So start writing down your caregiving goals. AC is going to pop it up in the chat. We want you to jot down some caregiving goals and who is on your care team. You can share with us, keep it to yourself, but really start thinking, what is your goal as a caregiver uh, for yourself as an individual and who is on your care team? For me, I know in order to make this nighttime routine happen, 
the number one person on my care team is going to be the love of my life, my husband. He's going to help us in ensuring that we can make all of this work and that he's helping us and supporting me in my caregiving journey and also as a mom so we can really get this nighttime routine down and make it the best possible day we can have. So I'm going to let you have a few seconds as you're, uh, as we transition slides. If you want to share with us, feel free to. Sharing is caring. And we're going to move on to pro tip. Ah, to ensure comfort for those in need. What an awesome goal. What an awesome goal. I challenge you to think about that in small, really impactful ways. What's the first way you can do that? How can you ensure comfort? Is that fluffing a pillow? Is that making sure you're picking up the medication? Have my best friend to listen to. Yeah, you're in getting that care team member involved. Let me talk to you and see what's happening. How can we best support each other? So as we're moving on to pro tip number four, I know we're getting close guys, you're getting close. We're gonna look at developing a schedule. Now I know that might seem confusing with uh, identifying uh, my best friend and support one another. Awesome, you guys, uh, I love this chat. Having a care team, having a care profile and having a schedule are kind of two different things. So you have your care profile as a living document to how to provide the best care for yourself and your loved one, but developing a schedule can help you in this journey without getting overwhelmed. So without proper organization, many appointments and meetings that we have and responsibilities can really be overwhelming to us as caregivers. It's really hard for us to really keep all of the things juggling. I've been there, I'm doing it, I'm doing it now. I just got a message to pop up, I need to call my Aunt Cheryl. So it's, we're juggling a lot of things throughout the day. A really great step in helping us kind of de-stress our environment because of course we're all sheltering in place. Some of us, we're all trying to keep safe and it's a pandemic. Really organize your day. What does the schedule look like for you? A great step is really looking at a calendar, keeping it in plain view, keeping it where you can pull it up on your phone digitally uh, in paper form. What, what does that schedule look like? Creating little simply daily routines and schedules can really provide structure that's needed. And that we found makes caregivers feel less burdened, less stressed. It helps us feel like we have a handle on our day. So when we create a schedule, we're looking at those things that really help us succeed. Um, I will tell you from my personal experience, I love a morning routine. People think I'm crazy. I wake up super early, but I wake up super early so I can listen to my news that I want to listen to. I can prep for my day. I can exercise. I can do self-care that I need to do. Even if it's raining like it is today, my self-care was doing yoga in my living room. Those simple, really quick, maybe it's five, 10 minutes, those things that I can schedule in, I know this is my time. This is my five minutes to be. So. Of course, with pro tip number four, I have to issue challenge number four. So Andrea, I like to go walking and listening to music and reading my book and then I do yoga. Awesome, look at you and your schedule. That sounds like a wonderful, awesome schedule. So let's look at our challenge. So starting tomorrow and Andrea is gonna pop up in chat, there it goes. Starting tomorrow, or if you've done this today, reflect. Let's record what are those daily routines that really help to create a lot less stress in your environment. Like I said before, morning routines are my Jimmy Jam. I love them, but I've kind of been knocked off lately with the pandemic and school and doing all of that. So I need to really, really look at how I can start reincorporating that morning routine to set my day up for success so I can be prepared. So at the end of the day, we're not all just scrambling to get it all done. We're able to sit back and relax, enjoy that quiet time between the hours of 8 and 8.30 because we want to get to bed a little bit earlier so we can be well rested. So we, I need to get back in my morning routine. That's all I need to do. I know I need to do that. So I'm gonna start creating a schedule around my morning routine so that my nighttime routine is even better. And I've set that healthy boundary. I met that goal. I've used my assertive communication. 
So guys, with that, read devotion and pray. Yeah. Ah, I love reading. I love taking time to watch the world wake up in the morning. That's my favorite thing to do. So I'm so excited to see all the early birds out there with me. So with that, guys, we're going to transition into our last pro tip of the day, which is celebrate your triumphs. We're going to throw a sharing question or reflection question in the chat. You can answer it. Feel free to. But at the end of the day, do you feel victory? Do you feel triumph? Do you feel like you made it? Do you feel like you accomplished something, anything? As caregivers, it's really hard for us to see our triumphs. It's really hard to see the victories when we're in the zone. We're doing the work. I say we're in the weeds, we're, we're digging in the flower beds, trying to get it going. It's hard to see what victory looks like for us because we sometimes describe that it's this big grandiose thing. So my last pro tip for you today, celebrate your victories. Be kind to yourself. Look for the good in every day. When something good happens, accept it. It's something you deserve. It is your triumph for the day, and it is okay to enjoy those things in life. And it's important to remember that triumphs can be big or small. Maybe it is that I get the kids to bed on time three out of five days, even one out of five days. That's a victory. Maybe all of you that are sharing this wonderful self-care morning, evening routines you like to do, Maybe that's your triumph at the end of the day. You were able to go outside for five minutes. You were able to do some yoga. You were able to meditate. Maybe that's one of your triumphs. It's important for you and us as caregivers to understand, yeah, yeah. Triumphs, at following your parents' wishes for their final days. Yeah, that's a triumph. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But triumphs are there for you. You can do this. You can see them when no one else can. You're there. Remember, you're the expert in this. Nobody can take that away from you. You're in it to win it. You're the best one that can provide this care. And when a triumph comes along your way, it's important that you're able to pick it up and grab it and take hold of it. So I want to talk about, because it is hard to look for those triumphs, and I'm going to take a second and I'm going to tell you about an unusual triumph that I had. So when me and my Aunt Cheryl were providing care to my grandfather, my Papa Charlie, uh, before I was a caregiver for my Aunt Cheryl, me and my Aunt Cheryl were, was a caregiver to my grandfather. He had leukemia and uh, some early onset dementia, some memory problems. So in those last days of providing care for us, we got posed with a question. And the doctors and the nurses came and they said, I, re I really think that it's time for us to start looking at whether or not hospice care is right and we need to call in the hospice team. And I can tell you that we were devastated because we thought that meant we'd fail. Like, isn't the point of being a caregiver is I keep you alive and healthy for as long as possible and now they're calling in hospice? Oh my goodness. It was really, really hard to look at it from a very victorious triumph point of view. You know, we, we were calling in hospice. That meant it was the end, that we essentially didn't do our job, right? Me and my aunt decided to take a step back and really look at this objectively. What did hospice really mean? And after talking to the hospice team and the hospice nurses, getting really curious, figuring out what that meant for us, me and my Aunt Cheryl had a conversation. Hospice was a triumph for us. It was a victory. It meant that at the end of the day, even though it was a really, really bad day, we completed the journey together which was my grandfather's wishes. We were able to come together and step out of our caregiving role and call in some of our support team on the hospice team. They were able to come in and take over medications and changing him and turning him and making sure that he had everything he needed. 
and we were able to complete that final day, that long, long, challenging final day together as his granddaughter and as his daughter. And that was a triumph. That was his final wish. And we were so busy looking as a failure, we almost missed that it was okay and that we were victorious. We had triumphed over a terrible disease. And at the end of the day, all of the wishes that he had were met and we had come out the other side stronger than ever. And of course, together. So as we go through and you look at what that means for you and triumphs for your day, I'm going to share my screen again if I can get it up here. There we go. And we look for triumphs and what they mean. Remember, they're all around you. They can be found. They are for you. Grab hold of them. Hold on tightly. In this world of caregiving, we don't get a lot of second chances. So it's okay to say we have a victory and a triumph in something so small or big. So to recap really quick, that was my did I give you my challenge? I might not give you my challenge. So my challenge this week, guys, for you, pro tip number five, take a second and think about the challenges you've had this week, even today. And if you want to share, drop them in the chat. I'm going to tell you right now, my triumph for the week is that I got to talk to all of you guys and I got to share some pro tips and connect with you, which I am so excited for. It's been a wonderful hour and I just, oh, it's amazing. And I can tell you, my colleagues will agree. Yes, I am this excited all the time. And I truly mean, I just love connecting with all of you guys. So to recap our pro tips, we're gonna self-identify. Being a caregiver means I'm an expert and I am the expert in providing care to my loved one. I'm gonna set some healthy boundaries because I'm gonna know them and name them. And I'm gonna do that by using assertive communication. And I'm gonna use that by using my favorite bestest word as a caregiver, no. I'm also going to create a care profile, a living, a living, breathing document to help us in understanding what it means for me to get care and what it means for me to provide care with the supports in place that I have on my care team. I'm going to develop a schedule. I'm going to see what routines work best for me during the day so I can get to bed and meet my goal of having an early bedtime sometime this week. And probably one of the most important ones. I'm going to celebrate my triumphs. We made it through this hour together, guys. I hope that you learned something, and I hope that throughout this week you'll be able to stop for a second and see the challenges that, so not the challenges, the triumphs that you have. We're not focusing on challenges, triumphs. You've got the challenges. We're going to focus on our triumphs. We're going to acknowledge them, hold on to them, and we're going to say we deserve this. So guys, my, I'm gonna pop up the chat real quick and let's see, ah, oh, thank you, thank you. So again, guys, this is my closing. I thank you for your time. My name is Leslie Poole and I work for Operation Family Caregiver, which is a free and confidential program from the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving. It's where we link caregiver coaches trained by yours truly and we link them up with caregivers for a free one-on-one -on -one coaching program that's delivered through video conferencing in which we look at look to identify your needs as a caregiver and how to support your loved one the best way possible without neglecting yourself for more information there is a link that's in the chat box or you can simply look us up at www.operationfamilycaregiver Dot org and remember guys pro tip number five celebrate your triumphs and if you want to look for more from us you can also look us up on social media you can connect with us at rci caregiving we're on facebook twitter and yes down at the bottom is my contact information yes i will answer your emails have any questions, want to reach out, find more out about us, you can contact our national office. You can contact me. We can talk about all of our programs and how we can learn and grow as caregivers together because yes, I want to know how to best support you. 
So again, guys, thank you. There's also a survey link in the chat box. Let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, and what topics you need to see. At RCI, we are always listening, and I want to know how to best support you in this space. So again, thank you for your time, and I hope you have an awesome rest of your week. Thank you so much for that, Leslie. Appreciate it. Um, I did want to give the opportunity and just let everyone know, I also did post a link in here as well. So I would appreciate it. It looks like uh, both myself and Andrea pushed, posted uh, just a um, survey. If y'all could take that, we'd really appreciate that. Um, it'll also be sent to y'all via email. And I did want to give an opportunity real quick. It looks like uh, Miss Brenda had a, she raised her hand. Uh, um, if you'd like, if you have a question, Brenda, you're more than uh, welcome to go ahead and just say it. I'll go ahead and allow you to talk right now. So. Um, I don't know if you have a question or if we've already answered it, but yes, please feel free to bring your a question forward. And it looks like all you'd have to do is just unmute yourself and. Uh... Thank you very much. I am so excited. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Andrew. I am so excited about today's workshop. I personally want to thank Leela Brown at Maxwell Gunner Air Force Base for inviting me. I am so energized. I love your uh, personality and how you included all of us and all the questions. Thank you all for putting this on because we all are caregivers in one way or another. So you all be blessed and thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. We appreciate your feedback, Brenda. And thank you so much for attending with us. We appreciate it. And yes, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free. We left a couple minutes open real quick. If anyone wants to go ahead and answer those questions, we would love to hear any questions, feedback. You know, we just appreciate everyone attending again. Um, so we'll give that a couple more minutes. And if not, then um, I think we're good to go. Uh, Andrea, Leslie, do y'all have anything else that y'all would like to say? No? Okay, awesome. I, I'm gonna plug I'm gonna plug one more time. If you have any questions or you want to talk to us, feel free. Andrew, I'm sure would love to talk to you. I would love to talk to you.